technology classes around the United States and the world are switching gears right around now, where everyone's been focused on crystallography, and now the semester pivots to the topic of systematic mineralogy. And the idea behind systematic mineralogy is that we're going to go through every single mineral of geologic and economic significance step by step for the rest of the semester. I want you to recall that the textbook for that we're using for this class is called Manual of Mineral Science by Klein and Dutrow and we're going with the 23rd edition. So those are where the page numbers are coming from that I will be referring you to. Now as we go through the systematic mineralogy, the big Roman numeral kind of organization is going to be based on mineral families. And we're going to start with the group of minerals that are native elements. This means there is no real bonding between different atoms. It's just things like pure gold and silver and copper. In the textbook, the native elements are talked on about on pages 33, 333 to 350. Okay, and very much, I just would, we're going to point out one thing about these native elements, is that there's so much history and cultural significance to these minerals. For early peoples and how civilizations have developed, even to today's um, society, economy and war has been based on a lot of these native elements. So let's just say, um, let's just put cultural significance as kind of this like really important anchor to us and we think about this in terms of war and we also think about it in terms of money. The most important element I think in human history is where well, we're going to start first and that is gold. For each mineral we're going to put the name, we're going to put the chemical formula which you must memorize. It's very easy for gold of course and we'll put the textbook pages. That here it's 342 to 343 where you're going to get the real details about gold as a mineral. Underneath this our organization is going to start with different um, numbers and we're going to start with the chemistry of gold. Now here we go, we'll just anchor this discussion with this picture and of course we'll put more pictures as we go. So in terms of starting this off let's get into the chemistry of gold which is very simple because it is largely chemically inert. We're just going to put the word inert here, which means it does not occur in chemical compounds very often at all, but it is rarely pure. That might be a surprise to you. What ends up happening is that gold almost always occurs with approximately 10%, let's say by weight or by volume, of impurities that are mixed in with it in the form of a solid solution, right? Do you remember that word solid solution? So what we're gonna say here is these mixtures, we call them alloys, you're right, you've probably heard that word before. Mixtures are called alloys and they're permitted by, by solid solution. So gold is rarely pure, that's an interesting point. The type of impurities that are coming in with gold, the most important of which is gonna be silver that's mixed in, but also other things, bismuth, lead, uh, copper, tin, iron, other minerals can be mixed in in alloy form with gold. Now one way that we me measure the amount of impurities in gold is with something called a carrot. Right? Have you heard of this before? You can say, oh, this is a precious gold necklace. It is made out of 24 karat gold, where the little K is the symbol for carat. Well, what this means, 24 karat means that it is 100% pure. There's no other elements alloyed with the gold. And as you go to lower and lower karat numbers, you get more uh, impurities. So 18 karat gold, is going to be 75% pure. And that means probably 25%, in most jewelry at least, is going to be mixed with silver. So you can go down, to what's 12 karat gold? Well, 12 divided by 24. And though how do we got to 75%, by the way, was 18 divided by 24 equals 75%. So that's what carat weight means in terms of gold as a metal. So the next thing we'll do under each mineral is we're going to go into the actual mineralogy beyond the chemistry. And our mineralogy 
of course, is related to chemistry. So if some of this gets a little unorganized, uh, so be it. And you can work through your, your own preferred organization if you'd like to. The hardness of gold is anywhere between 2 and 3. And the specific gravity is incredibly high. It's 19.3. Now, in an earlier lecture, I was giving the symbol for the specific gravity as SG. But the textbook actually has it just as G, so I need to correct that earlier mistake of mine. Most of the aspects of the mineralogy, and really the chemistry, is controlled by metallic bonding. Controlled by metallic bonding. Where they're these free electrons that are able to keep all the different um, gold atoms together. And this metallic bonding creates a lot of different properties that gold exhibits. For example, aspects of gold include its high thermal and electrical conductivity, Activity. It's also really malleable, right? And it's soft. You've probably heard about, oh, can you tell if this material is gold or not by biting it? And so the, your jaw pressure is strong enough to actually crush it because it's both malleable and soft, soft thanks to the metallic bonding. Another aspect of its mineralogy and chemistry too, I suppose, is that gold occurs with a 12-fold coordination number. So think back earlier to our crystallography lecture about coordination number. 12-fold means you can pack 12 atoms in three dimensions around a central atom, right? In 3D, so we draw all these. And this gives um, what's called closest packing. This is a really good example of a mineral with closest packing. And this produces the high density because you have a huge number of atoms packed around each other, and all those atoms are gold, which has a very high atomic mass. So we're going to say closest placking plus atomic mass, and maybe we should say high atomic mass, equals high density. The symbol for density, by the way, is rho, which you can use. And how is density related to specific gravity? Well, density, so specific gravity, let's just review since we haven't talked about it too much. It's the density of your mineral divided by the density of water. So you get rid of the units, basically, in that calculation. The last bit of the mineralogy that I want to talk about with you is that crystallographically, gold should form in the isometric system but it actually rarely occurs in crystals. Most of the time when you find gold, you'll see it dispersed as an anhedral mineral mixed with like quartz in this example, or even more likely than that, we don't see it in its uh, native state, but instead as detrital flakes in like sedimentary system, where the gold here, right, is like thin sheets and flakes and specks. So, but we're, so we're gonna say isometric, rarely in crystal form, or those are valuable to like mineral specimen collectors and museums, usually as flakes and specks. And what that's leading us to now is to talk about the geologic occurrence of gold. So our next little heading is gonna be a big three, and we're gonna have this be geologic occurrence. In my opinion, this is the most interesting thing to talk about with every mineral as we go through um, systematic mineralogy. The number one occurrence of gold as a, as a, in its primary source, so we're going to say, because gold occurs in two different ways. Primary, it occurs in hydrothermal veins. Hydrothermal veins with quartz. Let me show you a picture of that before we kind of move on and talk about how this works. Um, ooh, picture's a little big. Let me shrink it down. All right, so here's the idea. This is a hydrothermal vein comprised of quartz. Hot fluids percolate through the country rock, and it's, they scavenge all sorts of interesting things that get concentrated in these hot fluids. Eventually, they freeze out and form these veins. And so you'll take gold, which is distributed in, in the country rock, maybe at 0 0.0001 um, ppm, but the hydrothermal fluids might concentrate it to where it's like at one weight percent or 200 ppm, which may or may not be at an economic value. So what we're going to say here is hydrothermal veins and quartz, and the way it gets this way is that gold is scavenged by hot fluids 
you can basically picture water or salt water moving through the ground rock. Um, hot flu scavenged by hot fluids from country rock. All right, so that's just the rocks over a wide, wide region. And then concentrated. You might mine from a hydrothermal vein, but most mining actually occurs from secondary deposits, where those hydrothermal veins are then eroded, and material gets put into stream systems, which then concentrate gold. And that's what these secondary deposits are called. They're, they're technically, our, our word for them is a placer deposit. Not placer deposit, placer. It's a little, it's pronounced a little differently than it looks, so that's a C right there. And a placer deposit is an eroded primary deposit transported by streams, and then what ends up happening is the high density gold concentrates at the bottom of these streams. So let's write that down, and then we're gonna do a sketch. Yeah, I think we'll do it that way. So bear with me, we can erode primary deposits and moved into stream network. That water will carry the gold as far as it can, but that's controlled by the speed of the water. Gold's very dense, so it wants to sink. So what ends up happening is that gold's um, high density f makes it settle out. Let's just say that, settle out. Another word for settle out is deposited. And so if we were to draw this schematically, here's our like a mountainside that goes down into a river bottom, okay? And uh, should we do this, should we go blue? Uh -huh, we got blue here. There's our water. And we have a hydrothermal vein of quartz, plus or minus, I got yellow. Oh, can you see yellow? It doesn't show very good on, my, on the screen. Uh, but gold should be that color to make it orange to make it a little more easy to see. Okay, and so here's one way where this is our primary deposit right here. But we know erosion is acting and erosion will carry that material downhill. Sometimes the gold won't travel very far because it's so dense and you could get little deposits on hill slopes. But most of the time it travels all the way down to the stream where it will settle out to the bottom of the stream. Now it doesn't just settle out to the perfect bottom. Miners know that if you were to now look at that stream from a bird's eye view, Let's, here's a river with some meanders in it. We care about where the water is the fastest in the stream. And the water is always fastest on the outward bends. All right, so there it's really fast. Here it's really fast. Maybe from intro to geology, you remember what we call this area? It's called the talweg. Now gold, once as soon as water starts to slow, it gets deposited. So you're gonna find gold kind of in, associated with the bends in the river in places where water slows. It's not fully on the interbank because the water there is moving too slow to even carry, but it's somewhat inboard from that. And then to finish off gold, I think it would be we'd be remiss to not briefly talk about the history that it's had an effect on civilization. There's so many different stories we could tell here. I'm based in the United States and it certainly changed the history of the United States. Why has exploration happened to the West. Well, it wasn't just for farmers trying to uh, find freedom and, and land. It was for gold to get to Alaska, California, Colorado, Montana. All of these were explored for by gold, by English-based settlers or conquistadors from the Spanish culture. In general, what were these people looking for? Well, they were looking for the mother load. And when I say the mother load, I'm talking about the main gold deposit. Main gold deposit deposit. That's what everyone is looking for in the primary source. But then around an area with the mother load, you should find lots of secondary material as well. You could also think of this as the mother vein. Now in the United States, when we think about the mother load, we think of California, right? We think of California, the idea of go west, young man, find your treasure. And it was all based in an area of kind of central California, on the western flank, here's the Sierra Nevada mountains. And on the western flank of the Sierra Nevadas, there's this area here called the Motherlode, shown in yellow. These are where primary 
deposits are, and then also lots of plaster secondary deposits. So what I wanted to do was just walk you through this history. You know of the football team, the San Francisco 49ers. Well, that's based in the history of gold in our country. And, and if we were to kind of do a timeline across the page, um, I want to just tell you this story graphically and then with some pictures. And we're going to go from 1848 to 1849 and then march through a couple decades further. And, and the story really starts in 1848 when gold is discovered. And what's crazy is that California wasn't even the United States in 1848. It was still part of Mexico. But the Mexican-American War is going on. And the Mexican-American War, the Mexican people really didn't stand a chance. They had just finished having a civil war where over 2 million of their people um, were killed as they were trying to figure out how to govern themselves after they gained independence from Spain. So the United States and Mexico go to war. Mexico only loses about 15,000 people in this war. The United States has these generals that are getting trained that are famous now and named Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant. They're fighting in the American, Mexican-American War and, and the U.S. wins and we, um, what's the word? Concede? Accede? I don't know what the word is. I'm forgetting right now. But we gain much of Western North America in that treaty. Part of that includes California. Now, gold was discovered before this happens, but it was kept a secret. Of course, a secret like that can't stay too long. It was amazing. So in 1848, the city of San Francisco, SF, had about 1,000 people. Well, word gets out in 1848. All 1,000 of those people basically just leave. And they leave San Francisco, which is uh, right about here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's right about here. And they go up into the hills. They were finding so much gold, they were just picking it up off the ground. People could find $10,000 worth of gold in just a single day, picking it up as nuggets. All right? Word gets out and spreads to the east, and people move to California. These are called the 49ers, right? And they're, they're immigrating here to pursue the American dream, right? The American dream of get rich quick. San Francisco explodes into a big, important city, essentially overnight. And by the end of 1849, San Francisco has something like 40,000 people. At this time, the gold extraction is occurring in the form of panning. Now, this is a picture from a group of, um, I think, uh, of miners that still work, the mother load in California. And, and it was just like, and these are people that actually trained me on how to gold pan, so I, I thought I'd use one of their pictures. And so it was just small time people like this going out and trying to find their treasure in the stream beds of California. It wasn't sophisticated really at all. And so this lasts, this kind of panning time frame. Ah, we're going to go with panning is our big mechanism for extracting the gold at this time. And it lasts a period of about five to 10 years from 1849 on. During that time period, they pull out around 370 tons of gold is extracted in this way, which at today's prices is something like $23 billion. That is a ton of money. Now, also during this time, there's so much other important stuff happening. The Native Americans are killed. The redwood forests are decimated because all these 40,000 people need farmland and they need infrastructure. San Francisco's growing. And you know who gets the most rich from this whole process? It's the suppliers of goods. The suppliers of goods are the ones who make all the money because the miners are selling them gold in exchange for um, wood and water and buckets and food. And one of the people that makes his fortune here is Levi Strauss, right? You might be wearing Levi Strauss blue jeans right now. So that's a the process there. So then as time moves on, all the easy gold goes away. And so from the 1850s to around 1880, it's a new era of mining, and this is called hydraulic mining. So let's see, do I have a good picture of hydraulic mining? Uh, not so much. Maybe this one's good. This is actually a picture from Alaska of a miner working like up in the Klondike. But what happens here is, is you use these big hoses to spray gravel into sluice boxes where the gold gets concentrated. Okay, and this ends up being highly productive and also just decimates the landscape. So we're going to just say here that this is the era of hydraulic mining, which scars landscape. 
at this point, people are still only working the actual modern rivers. They haven't recognized that there's ancient rivers as well. And it's in, at the time frame from maybe the 1870s to maybe the 1890s where people realize, holy cow, we can go f just hydraulically mine and dredge the entire landscape. So we're going to say dredge, dredge and mine the full landscape. And this has changed. Much of the appearance of Central California has been dredged and mined. It's not the natural landscape anymore. It's been modified by man over 100 years ago. Oh, I forgot to put some uh, some money on here. So by hydraulic mining during this area, era, it's about another 370 tons, 20-something billion dollars worth of gold is found. 1870, 1890, as the dredging starts, this is highly productive. 610 tons of gold is found. This is equivalent today of around $38 billion. And around the 1900s, all that material is gone. I know this is kind of a long-winded history time, but from 1890 to 1940, this was the era of hard rock mining. And hard rock mining means you're going into the actual mother load. The hydrothermal veins have been mapped and found, and they are blown out with dynamite. People are digging tunnels underground, and they take the ore out along little railroad carts like you see in TV, and they take them to these crushers. And the crushers pound the quartz and gold mix to separate out all the material. And this was the big money maker. So hard rock mining operates during this era. 3,700 tons of gold are taken out of the mother load from the veins specifically. This is probably all sitting in Fort Knox right now. It's $230 billion worth of gold is extracted during this era. And then World War II hits. By presidential decree, the mines are shut down. The laborers are needed to support the war effort. And the hundreds of miles... It's literally, sometimes these mines have hundreds, 50 to 100 miles worth of tunnels. Hundreds of miles of tunnels flood with water. Of tunnels, mining tunnels and shafts. Tunnels fill with water. And you know what happens? We can't get that water out. I mean, we could, but it's too economically and environmentally challenging. Right? The, the amount of environmental damage from this whole process too was huge, but it's economically and environmentally impossible or too challenging to open the mines back up. And so they've stayed closed ever since. Environmental to reopen. But there's definitely still a treasure of gold sitting under those hills.